I'm tired, boss. Tired of being on the road, lonely as a sparrow in the rain. I'm tired of never having me a buddy to be with, to tell me where we's going to, or coming from, or why. Mostly, I'm tired of people being ugly to each other. I'm tired of all the pain I feel and hear in the world every day. There's too much of it. It's like pieces of glass in my head, all the time. Can you understand? John Coffey I guess sometimes the past just catches up to you, whether you want it to or not. Usually, death row was called the last mile. We called ours the green mile. The floor was the color of faded limes. We had the electric chair. Old Sparky, we called it. Oh, I've lived a lot of years, Ellie. But 1935, that takes the prize. That year, I had the worst urinary infection of my life, and that was also the year of John Coffey and the two dead girls. Paul Edgecombe Barbecue, me and you, stinky pinky pew pew pew, weren't Billy Jilly Hilly or Pa, it was French fried Cajun named Delacroix, woo! Wild Bill Wharton so we've had our conversation about Stephen King villains like Randall Flagg, who appears in almost every dimension of the Dark Tower to cause havoc and destruction. We've also had time to talk about bad guys like Andre Linoge, who may or may not be human at all, but something else entirely. Then there's that discussion we had about IT otherwise known as Pennywise the Dancing Clown. However, now is the time to talk about someone different. It's time to discuss a person who is quite possibly the polar opposite of all the villains I've mentioned so far. The time has come to tell about John Coffey, whose name is like the drink, but not spelled the same. Hi, hello, and welcome again, everybody, to another episode of Natural Juan. This time around, we're going to discuss John Coffey, the messianic figure in the Stephen King novelette series, The Green Mile, and all the people he finds there. That said, before we begin proper, I'd like to invite you all to subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications. Special shout out too to Mr. Jonathan Green, my patron in Patreon. If you would also also like to support my channel and what I do here, you can check out my PayPal information in the description below, which also has info on PayPal and Gcash for making quick, one-time donations. Alright, with all that out of the way, let's find out just who is John Coffey. John Coffey from The Green Mile, played by the late actor Michael Clark Duncan, can be best described as a tall and buff man standing at 7 feet and possessed of African features. In the novelette series by Stephen King, he had been incarcerated for the rape and murder of the Deteric twins, two young girls who are barely 12 years old. John Coffey is slated to be executed by electric chair, referred to as Old Sparky by the guards and is confined in the Green Mile, the block where death row convicts are kept and is run by head guard Paul Edgecombe, played by renowned actor Tom Hanks. Unfortunately, while this video is about John Coffey, there is so very little to go on even in the books. The things we do know about John Coffey is that he is a gentle giant of a man with a miraculous power that allows him to heal the sick and injured. That said, he is also saddled with a kind of childishness that implies an underdeveloped mind, though he is surprisingly wise in a lot of ways, especially in terms of empathy. Indeed, based on his interactions with the other characters and the awesome power he displays, his healing powers might just be a superhuman form of empathy. When asked to remember his past, John Coffey has but dim memories of being a drifter, going from place to place. He remembers being on the run, never settling in one place, and sometimes helping people with his powers. Before he is arrested for allegedly raping and killing the Deteric twins, he briefly recalls being helped by a kind old lady who also gives him a bag filled with food. We learn more about John Coffey from Paul Edgecombe, the head guard of Death Row, who does research on the character 
director during his free time after he was healed of his urinary tract infection. Based on his own findings, John Coffey had traveled across America either on foot or by hitchhiking on trains. He has suffered many cruelties as a child, based on the scars that cover him, and continues to experience the evil of other people as he travels the roads and while he is imprisoned. He has gone on to heal other people with his powers, but has never stayed in one place for long, either because people in those areas hated those of African heritage, or simply because he could sense on some level that people would begin worshipping him. Indeed, John Coffey is best known by the people he meets in the Green Mile, which includes Brutus, Brutal, Howell, played by David Morse, the narcissistic and selfish guard Percy Wetmore, played by Doug Hutchison, and Edward Del Delacroix, another death row inmate, played by Michael Jetter. To better know just what kind of people were in the Green Mile, I feel I first need to explain the kind of situation they were in. During the 1930s, the time the main part of the story takes place, the United States was in the throes of the Great Depression, sometimes called the Dust Bowl era by some Americans. It was a time of unemployment and suffering for a lot of people, although there were a lot of other countries in the world that suffered the same fate. The bottom line is that, back in those days, being unemployed was a death sentence for an entire family, and unemployment laws wouldn't be a thing until the latter part of the 20th century. Also of note was the horrible treatment of African Americans like John Coffey, who were often blamed for crimes they did not commit. John Coffey arrives at the prison just after another convict is executed, and takes up residence in said executed convict cell. He is then introduced to the guards, including a very unpleasant one with Percy Wetmore, and meets Paul Edgecombe last. While the guards mistrust him at first, they decide that he probably wouldn't give them trouble and leave him be. After all, it is Paul Edgecombe who tells them that they should be kind to the inmates of Death Row, as they aren't likely to live long anyway. Later on, John Coffey forms a kind of friendship with fellow prisoner Edward Delacroix, who also finds a friend in a little mouse who Del claims to have named himself Mr. Jingles. He also comes to see the innate cruelty of Percy Wetmore when the said guard kills Mr. Jingles just to spite Delacroix after the latter laughed at him when he was briefly held hostage by the truly deranged and dangerous Wild Bill Wharton. Luckily, John Coffey's healing powers is enough to bring the poor mouse back from the brink of death. Afterwards, Delacroix is sent to die by electric chair, but his execution is sabotaged by the hateful Percy Wetmore, which causes Mr. Jingles to disappear for a while from what is likely trauma. A little while after that, Paul Edgecombe, who is actually close friends with Warden Moores, the owner of the prison, learns that the latter's wife is suffering from brain cancer and hatches a plan to heal her with John Coffey's powers. After a brief confrontation and the warden tearfully admitting that nothing could be done about his wife's condition, John Coffey and the guards who accompany him enter anyway. Now, in the film itself, the scene where John Coffey heals Melinda Moores was quite epic, but it doesn't do the scene justice, at least in my own humble opinion. Of course, this may be because if the film scene played out like it did in the book, what is otherwise a somewhat uplifting drama might look like a full-on horror story as is typical of Stephen King. This is because in the novel it's proper, the state of Melinda Moores wasn't just dying, but almost out and out undead, and Paul Edgecombe recounts how John Coffey performs almost what seems like an exorcism on the poor woman. He notes how, in the eyes of Melinda Moores, some sort of malevolent being suddenly recognizes John Coffey and reacts like a leech that has been salted. Paul notes that while it may just be the cancer, he also recalls the sound of a bird's cry several times when John Coffey heals the woman, comparing it to a spirit being pried off by the big man's divine powers. Upon the return to the prison and the Green Mile, John Coffey suddenly grabs Percy Wetmore and seems to transfer the sickness he captured from Melinda Moores to the narcissistic guard. 
Percy then goes insane and walks to Wild Bill Wharton's cell and shoots him six times with his pistol. The film again deviates further from the novelettes when John Coffey reveals through his telepathy that it was Wild Bill who raped and murdered the Deteric twins. In the literary version, Paul Edgecombe comes to realize this through deduction and not by any supernatural means. That said, in both versions, just before his execution, John Coffey imbues Paul Edgecombe with longevity. While he may not be immortal, the head guard realizes that he may live for centuries before he finally dies of old age. Just before his own execution, John Coffey is offered a chance to escape by Paul Edgecombe. The head guard tells him that he is willing to do this even if it means losing his job, which may actually lead to the destitution and possibly death of the head guard's own family. John Coffey tells Paul to not even think about letting him escape, as death has been something he had been seeking all along. As the big man states in the quote above, he has no friends to turn to or even remember, and is tired of just wandering alone. It is also then that John Coffey's powers of empathy lets him tune in to the emotions and experiences of people all over the world. He tells Paul how it constantly torments him and likens it to having shards of glass sticking into his head. John Coffey is then executed and both Paul Edgecombe and Brutus Howell leave the job of maintaining death row to the remaining guards. Neither of them can execute another prison again after slaying what Paul believes to be a living miracle of God. The head guard then gets to live many years and the story begins when he tries to write about his experiences in the Green Mile. The sad part is that even after everything that's happened, we still learn so very little about John Coffey who or what he is, or where he came from. Paul Edgecombe likens him to Jesus Christ, and even Stephen King, the author of the novelette series, states that the initials of John Coffey are inspired by the Savior himself. However, no one is really sure, and some fans speculate that he might even be a human avatar of Stephen King's Dark Tower, who travels the different universes, helping those in need. But if you're going to ask me about my own theories, here's what I think. The immortal Paul Edgecombe will go on to become the emperor of mankind in Warhammer 40,000, and John Coffey was his inspiration for creating the Primarch Vulcan, and may in fact even have the DNA of the magical prisoner scavenged from Coffey's remains. Well, you had to ask, didn't you? Anyway, that's it for this episode of Natural Juan. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications. If you would also like to support my channel and what I do here, you can check out my Patreon, PayPal, and Gcash information in the description below. Natural Juan, 